I just want to respond though to that uh, news that just broke about the leader of the Wagner Group, uh, Evgeny Prigozhin. Remember him? Uh, one of the most famous hot dog sellers. Uh, he started his career. He became known to us all, didn't he? Perhaps June time for a very peculiar coup that wasn't a coup that all got very complicated and heated. He uh, is on a passenger list apparently for a plane, uh, a private plane that has crashed. So I have to say, we don't have official confirmation that he has boarded the plane. Um, so we can't, we don't know whether or not he's died or not, but he's certainly on the passenger list that's boarded, that was supposed to have boarded that plane. What do you make to this? It's big news. Well, you've got to remember this is a state, Russia is a state, which would send two people all, all the way to Salisbury to kill one of the state's enemies. Mm. Um, at considerable risk, because these guys, these two guys might have been caught. They might have been uh, picked up somewhere along the route. Um, and then take risks in order to kill their enemies. So you immediately think, if this is true, and Prigozhin was or was meant to be on the plane, uh, that this is not um, an, an obvious accident. It doesn't mean necessarily it was Putin, because he has even bigger enemies uh, in the shape of uh, Gerasimov and Shoigu, the two, the general and the, and the defence minister. He, was try he said his coup was aimed at and his coup failed, failed to get rid of them. That's the point. Not only did he call it off, but he didn't get rid, he didn't kill the two people, he didn't finish I know, off I remember it all the two unfolding. people he was, it was trying to get rid of. It was incredible. And, and then it doesn't require a great deal of meddling with a plane to leave it in a position where it, uh, in flight, is going to crash. Well, he, he kind of, after that, that odd coup that wasn't a coup that was very ineffective, whatever it was, he went over to Belarus, didn't he? There was a bit of a deal, uh, if my memory serves me quick there. Lukashenko was involved brokering that. Uh, and many people at that point, you were sitting there going, I'm not really sure how long this guy uh, is going to lead a very safe existence. Uh, it seems perhaps not long at all. Well, it, there was great speculation then that if you were going to declare a coup, and not see it through, that you're, um, you're, you're going to be on somebody's target list. I mean, I can't imagine sort of thinking when I got on the plane with him, I might have been nervous if I'd seen his name on the passenger list. That's the point I'm making. But it's obviously quite a serious issue, this, because one of the reasons why that coup apparently happened was the incoherence of Russia's military strategy, the fact that Putin is being forced to use um, um, these kind of people who are bought uh, and for hi guns for hire and so on, is a very unreliable, it's not kind of like a national mobilisation of troops. And so I think the kind of general falling apart nature of that, which is what the coup represented, and now these kind of cloak and daggers, somebody being assassinated and so on and so forth, sums up the way that we really do feel as though Russia has become a state that's no longer part of the modern Western. I mean, you can say, well, we didn't, we knew that already, but it's, it's, it's got all of the features of a, a state that's not part of the democratic world at all, um, which we already know because of their treatment of Ukraine. Oh. Well, one of the challenges in all of this is um, one of the first casualties in war is the truth, isn't it? So one of the challenges in this whole situation yeah, no, that's true. is trying to work out what, what is going on, who is doing what, what is actually truth, what is actually propaganda, what we have been pushed to believe, whereas perhaps there's something alternate uh, going on over here. It's very kind of tricky to work out what is what. Well, it's made worse in the case of uh, Russia because Kremlinology, I mean, what is going on inside the Kremlin is something we've never really mastered for the last last 40 or 50 or 60 years and people uh, even in the in the cold war used to be paid you know salaries in order to try and work out what was happening behind those walls and we still don't have a very clear idea i can't help mentioning there is a, a an, an exact historical precedent to this in the 17th century during the 30 years war when the holy roman emperor murdered uh, a man called valenstein who had a huge private mercenary army simply because he'd got too powerful and was thought to be threatening even though he was working for the for the emperor and but he had him killed anyway because he was too much of a threat it's it, this is it, it is true claire this is not modern europe this is 17th century yeah. europe this is what we're seeing nothing I, has changed i'd just like to point out that gb news is a place to go for your big history lessons where yes. you're going to learn stuff Definitely. i'm like listening a uh, mouth open thinking oh isn't he interesting he knows all about this sort of thing oh we have all, i don't we have all uh, the top brains <laughs> what can i say um but actually if you remember when you uh, think back to the start of this conflict um there was all this talk about what what uh 
Russia ridiculously call a special military operation, I think is uh, the, the terminology that they started using uh, when they invaded Ukraine in this way. I think they envisaged, or a lot of the conversation at that time was that they thought they'd be in, they'd be kind of uh, taking over, and then off they'd go within, you know, into the uh, sunset of glory, and it'd all be really quick. Well, this has all gone horribly wrong for Putin, hasn't it? Well, it's it? gone completely horribly wrong for Putin, but it's also the case that for those of us who have absolutely unapologetically supported Ukrainian self-determination and against the invasion, we can also say, and this is one of the confusing things at the moment, that there's an awful lot of people who have jumped on the bandwagon, of, as it were, of the Ukraine war. So one of the things that I find very difficult is the way that America's using it for its own ends. I mean, it has become something of a proxy war Definitely. for the West, right? Definitely. And but it's then been you've that got, for a while. Though. No, I know, but it's also genuinely the Ukrainian people fighting for their sovereignty and their self-determination against an invading army. So you don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater. But what, therefore, we have is even more, obs uh, you know, confusion about what the truth is, that oh. point, because we don't even know from the Ukrainians' point of view who's bought, you know, the well, Of course, single... because their media outlets were shut exactly. down there as well. Do you know exactly. what? This is so a conversation that will go on and on. What exactly uh, has happened? Time will tell.